small sub-post office is about to be robbed by a hooded burglar. His plan? To find the safe keys, steal the contents, and silently disappear. But this is no ordinary thief. The break-in has been planned with the precision of a military operation. The burglar, equipped like a terrorist, sawn off shotgun, 2-2 pistol, hunting, bandolier, and a hidden wire garage, is quite prepared to kill if necessary. A one-man crime wave, he's robbed hundreds of small post offices over the past five years without detection. But tonight will be different. For the first time, he will be challenged. During the night, about three, half past three in the morning, I heard a scratching noise, rather at all. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. I'm trying to get back to sleep. February the 10th, 1972, and Hilda and Les Richardson are soundly asleep above their sub-post office in Manchester Road, Haywood, Lancashire. He'd been into the bedroom, got Les's pants, took some keys out, thought those were the ones for the safe. The first scratching I heard was him trying to uh, get into the safe with those keys. He realised that they weren't the right keys, so he came up again. And I said to Les, there's either a cat or a rat got in, because I could just see the black foot. There's a rat or a cat in the bedroom. <laughs> Les. Les said run, so I ran into the other room to ring for the police. I kept dialing, no, 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 to seven, nine, nine, nine. He's killing my husband! Let's pull the trigger and it blew a hole in the ceiling. And I heard this shot and just screamed and shouted to killing my husband. And then put the phone down and never told them where I was or anything. <laughs> they both were fighting going down the stairs and then Les got hold of him again. And he kept me in Les and he, he hurt him so much, you just had to release him and that was it. Although he couldn't have known it, Les Richardson's bravery that night was to be the catalyst for a chain of events which was to shock the nation and launch one of Britain's biggest police manhunts. For as the intruder fled, he vowed never to be caught unawares again, a decision which was to lead to the cold-blooded killing of four defenceless men and the kidnap of a teenage heiress, Leslie Whistle. Instructions are taped under the shelf, telephone box. No need to worry, Mum, I'm okay. Held naked for three days and tethered round the neck by a wire noose 65 feet underground in a drainage shaft, Leslie was callously murdered when the ransom failed to be delivered. A crime so audacious that it was to go into the annals of British criminal history as one of the most vile and ruthless ever. Harrogate, February the 15th, 1974, two years to the day after Les Richardson had attempted to apprehend an armed intruder. Scores of robberies at sub-post offices had taken place in the intervening period all over the country by a burglar using a joiner's brace and bit to drill holes in windows to gain access. This time it was a sub-post office run by Donald Skepper and his wife Joanna on the outskirts of a Yorkshire spa town. He put his head round the door and we could see that he was dressed on in black and he had a black hood on. My father so was sitting up in bed and made to get out of bed and said, let's get him. And at that point, the man immediately fired one shot. I realized as I held on to him that he was dying. And I just held on to him and screamed, oh, my darling, my darling. And he just quickly died. 54-year-old Donald Skepper paid the ultimate price for having a go. 
Within hours, police had set up roadblocks and searched the surrounding area, but the killer had fled. The man every police officer in the UK was eventually to hunt was this man. He was Donald Nielsen, an anonymous loner who turns to crime when short of money. Married with a wife and daughter, Nielsen lived in an unprepossessing stone terraced house in the Thornbury district of Bradford. It was here, in a secret room in the loft, that he planned each robbery as a military operation. But his greatest asset was being a loner. He had no accomplices, never discussing his activities with anyone. Even his wife didn't know of his life of crime. However, the brutal slaying of Donald Skepper had elevated Nielsen to the criminal Premier League as a ruthless murderer. Soon, he was to kill again, twice in as many months. September the 6th, 1974, Baxenden Sub Post Office near Accrington, Lancashire. It had been a normal working day for Derek Astin and his wife Marion, and they'd gone to bed as usual. I turned round, my husband was sat on the bed, and there was a figure there, all in black. Very small, just with slits in his eyes. Derek pushed him into the bathroom. I got up, got hold of the hoover and said, hit him with this. And then the gun went off. He was bleeding terribly. All his skin and blood was all over the walls. It was terrible. Just like a piece of meat did his shoulder. And uh, I said to him, I said, don't worry, love, it's only your arm. And his last words to me were, it can't be. And of course, I didn't know that he'd been shot twice. The second shot in the back killed Mr. Astin. November the 16th, 1974, and Nielsen targeted a sub-post office at Langley in the West Midlands. With Christmas approaching, he was desperate for cash. Sidney Grayland had just closed for the night when Nielsen struck. Normally, he waited until around 3 a.m. before attempting a break-in. But on this occasion, he attacked early just after 6 p.m., entering through a rear door. Minutes later, Mr. Grayland was shot dead with a pistol at close range, and his wife Peggy battered so severely that she was barely alive or recognisable when found four hours later by a patrolling police officer. I stood on the window ledge and looked over, saw the safe door open, which was at the back of the shop, and saw cash on the counter and realised at that point that something was wrong. I went to the side garage where Sid's car was still there. We went up through the side of the car, through the door into the yard area, and I noticed that the back door was ajar, about two inches ajar. I pushed the door open, and Sid was lying flat on his back with his feet to the door. It was at that moment to, that I felt the body, he was cold, and realised that there was moaning coming from the far side of the room, the storeroom, where there was a pile of cardboard boxes, and I could see a woman who I didn't recognise. Her face was bloody and very badly swollen. And although I'd seen Peggy two weeks earlier uh, for some time, I certainly didn't recognise her at all. The three killings had netted Nielsen just £800 and a price on his head of £25,000. The man who was fast becoming public enemy number one was born on the 1st of August 1936. His father Gilbert was a textile worker and his mother Phyllis a housewife. The family name was Nappy and at school young Donald was ridiculed with such nicknames as Nappy Rich. While still a youngster, his mother died and Nielsen was raised by his grandmother. His school attendance was poor and at 15 he left with no academic qualifications to work on several local building sites. At 18 he was called up to do national service, initially failing basic training. But he loved army life and was posted to Kenya where the British were facing the terrorist Mau Mau uprising. Young Nielsen learned the techniques of how to survive in an unfriendly environment, a skill he was to hone and develop in his life of crime.
By the time he married his girlfriend, Irene Tate, a local textile worker, Nielsen had been promoted to Lance Corporal. He saw further service in Cyprus before he was demobbed. By now he was a father and put down a deposit on the house in Thornbury. Back in Civvy Street, Nielsen returned to the building trade and for a while prospered. He could afford family holidays in Blackpool and even bought an inflatable boat to take his daughter, Kath, diving. Just before she started school, Nielsen decided his daughter would not endure the playground taunts that he had had and changed the family name to Nielsen, which he spotted on the side of an ice cream bag. His days in the army had left its mark, so much so that he bought an old Austin Chamber and made his wife and young daughter take part in mock manoeuvres in the nearby countryside. Dressed in combat gear and recording the events for the family photo album, Irene and Cap acted out his military games, pretending to ambush enemy troops with homemade grenades. In the mid-60s, Nielsen decided to try his hand at running his own business, first as a taxi driver and then as a joiner, but jobs were intermittent. For five years, he struggled, and with little business acumen, he slid further and further into debt and a life of crime, becoming more successful with a sawn off shotgun than a saw. At the beginning of 1975, Nielsen was desperate for money. Robbing small post offices was hit and miss. He needed a bumper payday. For three years, he had spent hours in his loft planning an audacious crime, the kidnap and ransom of a young heiress. In 1972, Nielsen had read of a feud over the will of George Whittle, a former miner who had built a successful coach business in the Midlands. For 30 years, George had been separated from his wife, Selina, and for all this time, she steadfastly refused to divorce him living in a small terraced house, receiving two pounds a week maintenance. As George had prospered, he had bought an imposing white house in the village of Hiley, Shropshire, and lived there with Dorothy, the mother of his two children, Ronald and Leslie. When he died, George left over £250,000, divided between Ronald, Leslie, and Dorothy, who had changed her name to Whittle. The will was contested by Selina, attracting enormous publicity. When she was granted £1,500 and £30 a week, the case also caught the attention of Nielsen, and he began to hatch his abduction plot. On January the 14th, 1975, 17-year-old Leslie Whittle had left Wolfram College, Wolverhampton, where she was studying for her A-levels, to spend the evening quietly at home. Her mother had gone out for the evening, returning late. At about 10.15, Leslie's brother Ronald, who lived nearby, telephoned her. Well, I rang Leslie, I suppose, about 10.15, and uh, the main reason for ringing her was because I'd made her, her a bookcase for Christmas rather late, and um, I hadn't seen her over the weekend at all, so I was just ringing to check that it was okay. And we, we chatted for a few minutes. I asked her, you know, if it was okay. She said, yes, it didn't bad for a beginner, you know. At 1.15am, Leslie's mother returned home and checked Leslie's room. Seeing her daughter was asleep, Mrs Whittle took a sleeping pill and went to bed. Less than one hour later, Nielsen pulled up nearby in a stolen car with false plates. He entered the house through a garage door. Upstairs, he had a choice of four doors. He chose Leslie's. She awoke to a hooded figure and the barrel of a sawn-off shotgun. Nielsen forced her downstairs and into the lounge where he placed his ransom demand on advance. Dressed only in a full-length dressing gown, Leslie was then marched to his waiting car and tied up before being driven 65 miles to Bathpool Park at Kidsgrove.
As he toured the country robbing post offices, Nielsen had discovered the railway line running alongside Bathpool Park. His original plan had been to have the ransom money thrown from a high-speed train. But when he reconnoitred the area, he found a cavernous underground water overflow system. It was here that he was to hold Leslie. Climbing down metal ladders, he forced her 65 feet underground to a narrow ledge and tethered her around her neck with a wire noose. He told her to climb naked into a sleeping bag and gave her a flask of hot soup and a torch. He then left the terrified 17-year-old to attempt to obtain the ransom money. A few hours later, Leslie's mother discovered her daughter missing. Take Leslie's breakfast up at 10 to 7, knock her fire on, wake her up, turn round, no Leslie there. Shouted to Leslie, didn't get any reply. Looked round her room, clothes were still there, which she had put ready for morning. And just didn't understand it. Tried to ring Ronald, the phone was dead. I didn't realise the wires were cut, went down to Ronald's. And he said, well, maybe she's gone to college on an earlier bus. And I said, but her clothes are still there. Shortly afterwards, the ransom demand was found, £50,000 in used notes. Ron Whittle decided to ignore the dire warning it contained and contact the police. The most important point of that ransom note was that it said, any tricks or police, death. Well, you don't take that lightly. You don't dismiss that as a hoax, whether it's a hoax or not. Detective Chief Superintendent Bob Bood was head of West Mercia CID and about to leave the force and take up an appointment with the security services. He had an impressive record, having solved all the 70 murder cases he had investigated. I was convinced that it was a genuine kidnapping and all the stops had to be pulled out. No more no less, full resources deployed to get this girl back alive. And I promised Mr. Mrs. Whittle that I'd do all in my power to get her back. And that was always the police policy throughout the inquiry, the recovery of the girl alive. Nielsen's instructions on a length of dymo tape were to lead to two telephone boxes in the Swan Shopping Centre in Kidderminster but events were already beginning to go wrong. News of the kidnapping had been leaked to a local reporter by a Whittle employee. We interrupt this programme to bring you a Radio Birmingham news flash. News is coming in of a kidnapping in the Shropshire village of Hiley. It's understood a young girl has been abducted and police... And the Whittle home... And uh, the television was switched on, and the first thing on there was a photograph of Leslie Whittle and, uh, uh, and the kidnapping. And I thought, dear, dear me. I felt at the time that somebody had cut the intended path from underneath me. I thought... I, I, I don't say this at the time, but I thought this could spell the death knell for Leslie Whittle because of the ransom note. If it was true and it was genuine, tricks or police, death, and here we are, the world at large now knows. The kidnapper's instructions were to wait for a call between 8pm and 1am. When Ron Whittle reached the shopping centre, it was not only being staked by a Scotland Yard undercover surveillance squad, but also by journalists. Yet I have these fools coming up to me, you know, walking past me at regular intervals and looking at me and coming up and talking to me, and I, I got damn annoyed about it. I got to the stage eventually where I politely told them, or rather not so politely told them, to sod off. As a result of the press intrusion, the officer overseeing the stakeout decided to abort the operation and Ron Whittle was sent home. 
a decision which infuriated Bob Boone. No one was there to answer the phone. Inexcusable. Totally inexcusable. And I take the blame for it. I delegated the responsibility. But it, you don't abrogate your responsibility. That decision was the first of many mistakes made during the investigation. Just after midnight, the phones in the call boxes began ringing. It was the kidnapper, but his calls went unanswered. Anticipating that his first bid to get his hands on the ransom money would probably fail, Nielsen had a backup plan. His second attempt was for the money to be delivered in a suitcase to a freightliner yard in Dudley. It was to be taken by a circuitous route using the M6 motorway so that he could employ anti-surveillance techniques. He was standing on the motorway bridge to check whether or not police vehicles were there because he knew Ron Whittle's car number. And he knew Ron Whittle was going to act on the message, so he knew if he was tailed or preceded by a vehicle on more than one occasion, the police were involved. Elementary. Nielsen's intention was to guide Ron Whittle to a wall bordering Dudley Park Zoo. The suitcase containing the money was to be tied to a rope next to a green gate, allowing Nielsen to pull it over a wall, totally unseen. But not only were things going wrong for the police, Nielsen's meticulous planning was also hitting snags. As he taped a message onto this telegraph pole the day after Leslie's disappearance, he was challenged by a warehouse foreman, Gerald Smith. Unhesitatingly, Nielsen pumped seven bullets into Mr. Smith. Amazingly, he survived, only to die as a result of his wounds 14 months later. They'd had a memo saying to be careful, you know, to watch out for the IRA and things like that, because the freight liner was so vulnerable to that. So he walked up the drive and followed this man onto this Dudley Zoo car park. Joe realised that he was up to no good, so he turned round to walk back down to the terminal to phone the police when he shot him in the back. He remembered it all very vividly. He said he was thoroughly enjoying doing what he was doing. He enjoyed it, and when all the, the gun was empty, he still kept trying to get more and more jabs got, you know, more and more bullets out then. Gerald Smith described his assailant as looking like a tramp, and as a result, no immediate connection was made with Leslie's kidnapping. So they're looking for a tramp. That was the description. And uh, it was no interest to me at all. As far as Chief Superintendent Booth was concerned, it was an unrelated shooting. He had other, more pressing problems, caused by the glare of publicity the investigation had attracted. Then we started getting sightings of Leslie Whittle. The public, with their best of intentions, were phoning the lines and telling us that Leslie Whittle was here, she was there, she was everywhere. And we had squads flying all over the place. Back in Hailey, there was another problem. Hoax calls to Ron Whittle from people pretending to be the kidnappers. One of the earliest was from Gloucester. Yes, Ron Whittle speaking. Three suitcases. Sorry? Three suitcases. Two big ones and one small one. Five thousand in the small case. I've had so many hoax calls. Well, this is another hoax call. Believing it was genuine, Ron Whittle, followed by detectives, raced off to keep the appointment. Much to Mr. Booth's annoyance, the media had again been tipped off, and he decided to take drastic action. The press were in convoy following Ronald Whittle. It's bizarre. There's a girl's life at stake, and here we are, thinking we're dealing with a kidnapper, and we've got a convoy of pressmen. So I phoned information room, and I said, close the motorway. He said, what? He said, whose authority? I said, mine. He said, you can't do that. I said, you'll do it now. I said, or else you'll answer to me. I said, and somebody else as well. I said, close the motorway. There is a ransom demand operating at the next junction, and I don't want the pressmen there. 
But two nights after Leslie's abduction, as she lay freezing below Bathpool Park, a genuine call was received. Nielsen had made contact again. Failure this time would mean years of careful planning going to waste. He had no further fallback plans. We'd briefed a few people about um, what to do if the phone went and they had a suspicion it was uh, the kidnapper. And one of the people I had briefed was a man named Rudd, the transport manager at Ronald Whittle's depot at Highley. Well, I was sat at home watching TV with my wife and children. And the phone rang. To my great surprise, I heard Leslie's voice. I tried to speak to her, but then realised that it was a tape message. Marley is to go to Kid Crow's post office telephone box. The instructions are inside, behind the back board. I'm OK, but there is to be no police and no tricks, OK? The first time it came through, uh, I hadn't got a piece of paper and pencil, so I couldn't take the message down. But fortunately, it was played again, and I took the message down, and then got in the car, rushed up to Whittles, Beechcroft, and give Mr. Booth the message. The whole object of the exercise was to go to Kidsgrove, act on a message left for us in a kiosk, and do what it said. And we told Staffordshire police. And my instructions to my deputy was, tell them to stay in bed, that's the best place for them. Not being funny, but you know, I, d I didn't want policemen crawling round all over the place. By the time I collected the money, and then uh, I got lost on the way to Kidsgrove because I'd never been there before. Uh, and then I had difficulty in finding the instructions in the phone box. All that took this awful time, about an hour and a half or something like that. Anyway, he's there at the post office at uh, about as near as I can think, half past two, quarter to three, in the morning. Now, I say that because he phoned um, our incident room. He got a transmitter on him. All he had was a transmitter on him. He had no bug with the money. As the message said, any tricks or police, death. So there was no bug, no intercepting bug or anything like that for us to uh, follow, follow the money. And um, he couldn't find the message behind the door. There is a blackboard on which the telephone equipment is mounted. And it was supposed to be behind there. Well, I ran my hand all the way round there twice and couldn't find any message. And so then I checked the board a third time and uh, I must have just ha had my hand up a little bit further behind the board and I just felt something brush my fingers. He found it and it told him to go up to Boat Horse Road and to drive onto the car park and to go along the road and to f stop over a by a wall, which was a, a bridge actually over the railway line and to stop and flash his headlights. And he then had to run to uh, a flashing light and drop the money. The wall referred to was the wall of the railway bridge. In fact, because there's a slight left-hand sweep there, I didn't even see that wall. And then you come to the, the dam, uh, which forms the actual bath pool itself. And I assumed that that was the wall. So I was probably quarter of a mile beyond where I should have been. It must have been between 3.30 and 4 o'clock before I actually got up to Bathpool Park. But Ronald Whittle being late caused Nielsen to panic. He thought a light plane flying overhead was a police helicopter, and he was suspicious of a courting couple stopped on the road running through the park. But the final straw was Nielsen believing he saw a squad car driving past his hideaway. He thought the police were closing in. Afraid and angry that his third attempt to collect the ransom had failed, Nielsen raced through the drainage system and pushed Leslie off the tiny perch she had been forced to crouch on for two days. As he clambered to the surface to escape, 
Leslie was left to die, hanging from the metal tether round her neck. Bob Booth's decision not to inform Staffordshire police of what was happening on that last ransom run was to cause furious recriminations between senior officers of the neighbouring forces. As former head of the Staffordshire CID, Harold Wright remembered when he revisited the drainage system where Leslie's body was to be found months later. It was a mistake, in my view. And it was the view of many other officers at the time, it was a mistake. Should have been local cooperation with it. We first became aware of them coming to Bathpool Park on the Thursday night, Friday morning, early Friday morning, in the week that Leslie Whittle had been kidnapped. And inquiries were made of our information room at police headquarters, Stafford, asking for directions to Bathpool Park. Well, initially, directions to the Kidsgrove Post Office and the telephone kiosk there, and later to Bathpool Park. We were told then that on no account should we draw attention to Bathpool Park and to keep our officers away. But one officer, either innocently taking a shortcut or sent deliberately by a senior officer, drove through the park that fateful night. Days later, Bob Booth was handed a telex message detailing car numbers in the area at the time. Staffordshire, on the night in question that we're there at Kidderminster, had checked all these vehicles, and it listed all the vehicles. And when I look, I nearly died. There's Ron Whittle vehicle shown out there. There are the surveillance vehicles, the Metropolitan Police surveillance vehicles, shown out on this telex list. And there are crime squad vehicles shown on the list, who were three miles away. So it was obvious to me that what Staffordshire had done under the auspices of some senior officer had uh, put a container operation in force to check out all the vehicles on the move or in suspicious circumstances around the very area that we were operating. I couldn't believe it. Six days after police had followed the ransom trail to Bathpool Park, they received their first breakthrough. The car Nielsen had abandoned after shooting Gerald Smith was reported as suspicious by a member of the public. The discovery raised hopes of finding Leslie alive. T T V 454H. Don't forget these things, do you? There was a tape recorder on the seat of the car. And uh, we uh, listened to the tape, and it played Leslie Whittle's voice. Mum, go on to the M6 North to Junction 10, and on to the A454 towards Warsaw. Instructions are taped under the shelf and telephone box. There's no need to worry, Mum, I'm OK. Um, I've got a bit wet, but I'm quite dry now. I've been treated very well. OK? When I heard that tape played, I don't mind admitting that I felt sick. It was um, a genuine ransom demand operated by Leslie Whittle's voice, obviously to be played to take us to kids grow and she was pleading for no police that she was all right and uh, <clears throat> uh, I listened to that and uh, I thought that uh, more than ever I would do all in my power to get her back alive she just touched a soft spot when I heard a voice, that's all. Because I've got a daughter older than that, and I know what Mrs Whittle was going through. 
But the abandoned vehicle was to give up crucial additional evidence which linked the kidnapper of Leslie to the shooting of Gerald Smith and the murders of three sub-postmasters. Ballistic analysis showed the gun used to shoot Mr. Smith had also been used in the murders of Sidney Grayland and Derek Astin. Now the inquiry took on a new urgency. Bob Booth and every other officer knew Leslie Whittle was in the hands of a triple killer. You don't challenge this fellow at all. If you challenge him and he's got that gun handy, you'll never tell anybody about your suspicions. Do you understand it? Please, bear that very much in mind. We don't want any dead heroes on this job at all. But as the days turned into weeks and no new leads appeared, Superintendent Boone called a mass briefing of over 400 detectives in a renewed bid to catch Britain's now most wanted man. Bob Booth went on television with Ron Whittle to appeal to the kidnapper, displaying the £50,000 ransom money. As you can see yourself, the money is here, so if he'll get in touch, then I will go alone. I've been alone already. Whatever suspicions you might have had in the past about what police involvement in this case is in conjunction with Mr. Whittle, dismiss it from your mind. Use whatever communication you feel you can do best by getting hold of that money and releasing that girl. And Mrs. Whittle made a public plea for the safe return of her daughter. Well, I would just like her to get in touch with me, if at all possible. I think that, um, if I may come in here, that the um, point is that we... The most important thing is that we want Leslie back. Bathpool Park had been briefly searched by Scotland Yard officers immediately after the original ransom trail led there. Three months later, Superintendent Booth asked Staffordshire Police to search it again, this time thoroughly. Shortly afterwards, a grim discovery was made. I went down the shaft to the bottom and found it was the body of Leslie Whittle hanging from a wire noose. But when I did see the body and see that uh, she'd possibly been lying on this mattress, on top of the bottom level and then saw that uh, the girl was naked body starting to decompose blood and other stainings on the legs and a wire ligature round her neck and she's hanging there with her feet possibly six to eight inches from the drain level at the bottom I didn't know who I was dealing with. I didn't know that this man would go to such extreme lengths and push a girl to her death, tethered like a dog in a damp, foreboding place like she was incarcerated. It's incomprehensible. As Leslie's body was brought to the surface, a third inch-by-inch inch search of Bathpool Park was to embarrassingly reveal crucial evidence missed earlier by the police. But even more humiliatingly, members of the public, on hearing Leslie's body had been discovered, started handing in vital clues they had found and taken home. On top of the spillway where the money was to be dropped was found the torch. The grill which was where the money was to be dropped through, had been unbolted and was lying there. A month later, one month later, near the spillway, after Staffordshire's searching of it, is found a piece of dymo tape which said, drop soup, uh, suit care down the hole. It was spelt wrong, so Nielsen had thrown it away. The public finding things after police have searched there, inexcusable. As Leslie was laid to rest, inter-police rivalries began to surface. Unfortunately, Staffordshire have our body but we want the murderer. I don't care where he's arrested, I don't care by who he's arrested. We'll cooperate with anybody, 
but the hunt for that man is from here. These people have been working since November, since he came down to Langley and shot somebody. They've been working after that since he shot Mr. Smith. And I've been working non-stop with them for nearly 24 hours every day for seven weeks. And we'll work until we get him. And if we don't get him today, we'll get him tomorrow. In a bid to ease tensions, Scotland Yard was called in. And Commander John Morrison arrived to take overall charge of the hunt for the man the media had dubbed the Black Panther. Soon afterwards, Superintendent Booth was sidelined after a surprise visit by Commander Morrison. He said, The Chief Constable, Chief Constables, are not satisfied that you're cooperating fully with this investigation. And uh, we are to complain against you that you be returned to your force. Well, I didn't think I was hearing right. Um, things like this have never happened in my experience. One colleague complaining against another unless there's valid reason. And I thought of no valid reason. So I said, oh, get on with it. Thinking it would fall on stony ground. When I told the Chief Constable about this, he must have already known, because the complaint had been made. But it was only a complaint. There was no inquiry. There was no hearing internally. Nothing was done about it, save for the fact that again the press were fed the information that I'd been withdrawn from the investigation into the post office murders, and it was vitriolic. For the next nine months, more than 200 detectives worked on Britain's biggest manhunt, sifting through leads from all over the country, building up an index system of over 8 million cards. Every police officer in the country was issued with a special card giving details of the Black Panther. But in the end, it was old-fashioned coppering which trapped Nielsen. On December the 11th, 1975, Police Constables Stuart Mackenzie and Tony White were on patrol in Mansfield Woodhouse in Nottinghamshire when they spotted a man acting suspiciously. He was um, passing the end of the street opposite us and he was scurrying and averting his face from us. It didn't look right. I mean, I said to uh, Tony at the time, you know, that man's been up to something or he's going to do something. Let's check him. As we get level with him, I pull the car up. Tony winds the window down and says good evening sir this time of night we like to check strangers out would you mind telling us where you've been he said i'm just coming home from work and whilst i'm writing the uh, replies down the words are said to us don't move any tricks and you're dead we looked up and there was sawn off double barrel shotgun sticking to the window I'm looking down the business end of a sawn off shotgun. And I say two choice words. One of them's hell. And I just said, Jesus Christ, not in Woodhouse. Then he said, you, in the back. So Tony has to climb over the passenger seat into the back, and he puts him right in the corner of the car. And then, then opens the door and slides in the side of me. He put the gun under my armpit, said drive. And I just said, where to? And he says... Just drive, no tricks, or she dead. The gun was hard up like that in Max's armpit, and you appreciate to have pulled it, the seat would have been hitting into his side, to have pushed at his arm in the same effect. You know, he'd have been a goner. Um, Max signaling me in the mirror. I'm sort of going up and down like that. In other words, get that gun from out of my armpit, and he's going... And then I realise that he can't, because of the position it's in. There's a, a fork in the road, and Max says, um... Which way, sir? And does that. And just jog with the wheel slightly. At the same time, I'm hitting the car brakes and I lean back. I shouted, get him, and I grabbed the gun, pushed it up and away from Mac. The gun goes off at the side of my face. And dragged my left arm round his neck and pulled him down over the seat. I hit the door handle and roll out the car. The gun going off so quickly I thought he'd been blown out. I got the gun off Nielsen and 
Was he straining him? I'm thinking, well, Tony's either dead or badly hurt. I had to give him a couple with my elbow because he was still fighting like a wildcat. This miner came up to us and says, Do you want any help? I says, Yeah, can you just hold his hands together? I was on days from Pit Larkin and they were local. Uh, dance at the club on a Thursday night and I'd been up there and decided to come on just a shade early to go to a fish shop. He just stood there waiting for your chips and all of a sudden there's a bang. I didn't think it were a gun, it was just it was a bang, almighty bang. I am door and rushed outside and there's a, a policeman shouting, my mate's been shot. And I said, what's going off, what's going off? You know, you just rush into it. And he said, hold his hands, hold his hands. And of course, this miner just went like that. With the utmost ease, it was unbelievable. I did a body search. Took a large sheath knife from his right hip, which is what he'd been going for. A shotgun belt with 22 cartridges in it. And another smaller sheath knife from his left boot. For two days, Nielsen refused to speak or tell anyone who he was. Then he suddenly confessed, admitting he was the Black Panther. Britain's biggest manhunt was over. But for some, though, the scars the investigation had left would never heal. I am totally accountable to the public and to the Whittle family for the loss of their daughter and their sister. And I'll never, ever shirk that. And I'll never get rid of it from my mind. But all I can say, with true honesty is that I did my very best to try and get her back alive. And I failed. Mum, there's no need to worry, Mum. I'm OK. Um, I've got a bit wet, but I'm quite dry now. OK? 